Steve, we're going to be talking today about this part here, which is um, a representation of a pylon which goes onto an aircraft, which you'll tell us a little bit more about it shortly. Firstly, for our, our channel and our audience, can you tell us who you are and what you do here at Heller? What is your main role? Yeah, morning, Paul. Hi. Yeah, uh, my name's Steve Masters. Um, I've been with the company for uh, 35 years. I uh, started as an apprentice, apprentice, then worked some time in Germany. Uh, and then when I came back, I took on the role as engineer and manager, and I manage a team of guys and girls here that look after the application uh, through the UK market. Okay, now tell us about this part and the story. Behind we get into the technical detail of how it's made and the challenges that you face. Tell us what it is and what the journey's been here, what you were trying to achieve. Okay, so this is a, a, a sample titanium uh, pylon. Uh, so it's a representative pylon, it's not for a particular uh, company as such. Um, but there would normally be four of these on each wing of an aircraft and that would be used to mount the uh, the engine to the to the to the aircraft. Okay, now and you were approached by a customer we're to develop these and produce a turnkey uh, project in order for them to satisfy their, their client. Correct. We were approached by a, um, one of the aerospace tiers uh, to look at a process for manufacturing this pylon uh, or this set of pylons and we set about um, a bidding process together with them. Uh, which was quite a protracted and long process uh, in the in the aerospace sector. It's uh, kind of about two years, you said, you've been working with them to develop Overall, this. yes, yeah, I mean... Because how important is it to get it right? Because that's It's hugely important because, uh, especially with titanium, the cycle times are quite long compared to aluminium parts. Um, and any mistake you make is obviously magnified. So piece part cost is very important and we have to commit to that. Uh, and in parallel to that, the the amount of time it takes to machine the pylon uh, dictates how many machines we're going to need to employ. Mm. Um, so that really is something that you need to get right and right from day one. And they're looking to be running this 24-7, aren't they? So, so typically this would run 24-7 with, with a lights out shift as well. Okay. So they're saving on labour. Okay, right, we're going to look at this in two ways. We're going to look at this in the roughing strategies and the finishing yep. as well. So we're going to get to the detail of how this is made and the challenges that, that, that you face. Let's talk about the roughing. How does it all start? So it starts off with uh, a forging, and the forging has, it varies, but it, it, it's 7 millimetres up to 10, 15 millimetres of stock in certain areas, depending on the component type. Uh, we then rough that on our four-axis machine, uh, that has a very robust spindle, so we're, ha we're employing a gear-driven spindle to take uh, large volumes of material away, and that has approximately 2,200 newton metres of torque. This is, this is a key point to this roughing side, isn't it? Correct. And, and when we look in, at modern-day strategies, people often say you're better off to deploy high-speed machining processes, smaller cuts, um, but this, in this instance, that's very different, isn't it? Yeah, good? yeah. F for us, it's much more important that we utilise the various spindles we have on offer for our machines. So we can, we can employ a, a spindle for aluminium, which is a high-speed spindle, or in this case, we have a, a motor-driven spindle with an additional gearbox that gives us up to 2,200 newton metres of torque. And the reason we did that, Paul, was this, this has a, a slot in it um, which requires a very large side and face milling cutter. Well, let's start with that because in a minute we'll talk about the pocketing, the drilling and all the other processes. Um, but in here, this was one of your real challenges, wasn't it? In order to, to what did you need to solve? Well, we had to get this, this slot cut in and it's a very accurate slot. Uh, but to rough it out, because it's got such a large diameter tool, you need a tool spinning at 30, 40 RPM, needs a huge amount of torque. Spindle power is not really the, the question there is the torque, it's being able to transmit that torque to the cutting edge, which in this so you're instance, at 35, 35 RPM. RPM. Yep, yep. How do you on earth do you generate? You must be generating some torque to be able to still cut material, especially titanium, at, at, at that speed. That's right, and, and that's where the benefit of the Heller machine comes in with our spindle. Um, but not just the spindle, it has to be the whole machine's system. So we looked at our tooling reach um, and we designed our fixtures and our processes to ensure that we had minimum tool overhang. We also employed cast iron cubes so that there was a dampening effect um, to help with the machining process. Right, so this is a story not just about the machine, it's about everything yeah, that goes absolutely. around it, which will, which will unfold as we walk through this as well. So that's one area you faced a challenge. What else is machined on in here? And talk to us about the amount of tools you use, why you select certain 
tools and the certain strategies and where those strategies come from for the rest of the machining. Okay, so in the roughing phase, we're looking to get everything down to an envelope of roughly three millimetres. So we're roughing the part with predominantly um, inserted cutters for cost effective reasons. Um, a lot of this will be hogged out with heavy duty uh, helical mills. Um, some machine tool suppliers will tend to go towards what they call high speed machining. So they'll use high feed cutters taking very small amounts of metal uh, but taking lots and lots of cuts. Um, that's well suited to some applications. In our instance we're able to take much heavier cuts in the roughing phase of, of the process uh, because we have that rigidity in the machine. Okay, now is that then faster? Is this what we're saying? Is it, is it a quicker process to do it in the way you're doing it with the heavier machine, the heavier machining operations than doing these lighter, smaller cuts? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but what we are able to do is we're able to use our software to compare the two. And what we did in this instance, we went over to our tech centre uh, in Germany, um, and we now have that facility here in the UK as well. We were able to actually prove on the actual material that the customer supplied us with the actual cutting tool. It's great cutting pixels, but when you have material available to cut uh, and you can do cutting trials, that gives your customer a huge... Um, so it's almost like a simulation, you compared the two, you, exactly. did, what you, you did them in, in both different methods and this, the, the, the heavier duty of machining was the fastest? It was the fastest, yeah. yeah. And was it the most cost effective because that's you know, the cost of the tooling, the cost of everything that goes around it, because that is how you equate your efficiency in this sense. Yes, yeah. So we looked at the, the, the piece part cost and we compared the um, sort of conventional values that you would see with titanium, the rule of thumb figures if you like. Mm. And what we saw with our setup, with the rigidity that we were able to bring through the fixture in and the shortened, shortened tools, um, probably, an, probably an improvement of around about 20%. Now that's not across the board, but that's on many tools that we employed for the roughing. All right, important point here, 20% potential saving in, in, in tool life because of the makeup of your solution, the machine, the fixturing, yep. the stability then that, that is held within the process. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. And over amortised over a 24-7 over long periods, that's a massive, massive factor, it's, isn't it's it? It's a huge saving for the customer, but when we're in the bidding phase, it's important that we stick to that because there's a lot at stake. Mm. So the customer's then going to bid based on what you're demonstrating and showing him in terms of the savings? He's going to bid based on a piece part cost and a level of investment in the capital equipment. And the two trade each other off, don't they? So if you're using a lot of carbide, cutting a lot quicker, you're going to need more, uh, less machine tools. If you go slower, you're going to need um, more machine tools, and that's that, it's that balancing so, act between capital investment and the piece part cost. And it's also important to mention you were competing with various other machine tool manufacturers yes. when you were developing yes, this process. Yeah. Um, before we move on to the fishing, uh, fishing finishing is is equally as important here is to talk about the the processes that you do pocketing. Um, you know what are the other machining cycles within here, and how do you go about? creating them from a program perspective to make sure the strategy is as good as and effective as it possibly can be. Okay, so we talked about the, fa the uh, disc milling, we also have face milling. Uh, we also have a lot of pocketing inside here, creating the radii. Uh, there's drilling. Um, we create some reamed holes for subsequent operations. So there's reaming. Um, we do some flanking operations on here as well. So there's... And do you position this part in order so that you can get to this face with maximum tool um, machining capability? Because it's a four axis machine, um, we do tend to do a lot of waterline machining, but where possible, we orientate the parts so that we can use the fourth axis on the machine, sorry, yeah, the B axis, yeah. to, to face mill where possible, because that's generally the most effective way of, re of re removing the material. And what a bit about things like chatter and stuff like this and vibration and things like that? Ha ha when you're roughing, how do you, how do you eliminate those? I know we've talked about the fixturing and all the rest of it. Is it a combination of all those still? It is, but th there's also, we also look at the level of step over for each tool and we're able to um, sort of apply rule of thumb figures that from, from, from historical data basically. Mm. Um, so we know roughly what we can take in titanium with a given tool diameter and a given um, spindle setup. Yeah. Okay, so the roughing time on this, how long is two operations, top and bottom essentially? Yes, isn't it? so we do, we do one side and then we flip it and do the other side. And typically on the four axis machine, that's around about four to five hours depending on the part 
and, th and this is what your customer is relying on you to provide exactly. correctly um, Correct. in order for them to bid. Okay, then we move on to finishing um, here, Steve. So you change the machine now, don't you? It goes on to what is the HF, is that right? Correct, so this part will then go away and be stress relieved. It comes back, bearing in mind now that it's got just three millimeters on each surface or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. It then goes on to a five axis machine where we're able to articulate the, the part to the spindle in, and in, this is the Heller HF which we have behind this us This is here. the Heller HF 5.5 machine okay. um, and with this HF then we're able to use the A axis and the B axis of the machine to push, position the part for uh, 3 plus 2 machining but also in, in certain instances some full 5 axis machining where we've got non-planar surfaces. Uh, and why would you have those then to do full 5 axis? Why would you need that on this part? For example, one of these faces would, would follow the, the wing contour of the aircraft. This face here? So it follows the wing contour, which isn't a flat surface. And we have to replicate that on that, on that surface. And for that, we do need to use five axis um, processes. And what's the main difference then between your roughing, and your, fin your roughing and your finishing here? Are we now cutting in a different method? Are we now running faster, different tooling? Where does it change? We're tending to take lighter cuts, and there's, there's a reason for that. The specifications involved in producing these aircraft parts, uh, we have to remain within certain parameters when, we, when we're finishing. Um, there's very strict guidelines as to what we can run and how fast we can run. Um, but we're tending to run with a lot more solid carbide tooling uh, because we've got smaller cutters getting into tighter corners uh, and uh, tighter radii. So generally it's solid carbide as opposed to in the, in the roughing phase we talked about using more inserted tools. Okay, and are these things as well that you have established by making comparisons? Yes, correct. So what we did when we engineered this is we created a digital twin of the machine, of the fixture, of the tool, of the part, and we were able to verify each and every process prior to it going to the machine. Now that saved an awful lot of time in the rollout of this program because with aerospace projects the bidding phase is so prolonged it very often eats into the SOP date which never changes you probably well know. Yeah. Yeah. So we were, we were under a lot of pressure to make sure that everything was engineered up front prior to us actually cutting metal on the, on the machine. And how accurate was creating this digital twin? What, what did you, yeah, <laughs> how, yeah, what was the comparison? Well if, if you take cycle time for example, um, we did some dry runs in the early days and then we checked that against our digital twin and we probably saw less than 5% difference. Wow. So we were, at, we were able to take that and um, correlate the result for the actual process. So and that gives the customer a huge amount of confidence going forward mm -hmm. uh, and mitigates risk uh, for the customer because 100%. there's a lot of investment at stake when, you, yeah, when you're talking. Now, now what's really intriguing here now is a couple of these f finishing processes here. You told me earlier about the accuracy that you need to achieve on these parts. Can you reiterate that for the, for the channel and then how do you go about achieving them? And just how critical it is because these are final stages of the manufacturing and this could be worth tens of thousands of pounds. Correct. So with, with the finishing operations we have a lot of process security steps in place. So we, we do a, an awful lot of probing. So we're able to probe, cut, cut metal, reprobe, almost using the machine as inspection as well. Um, we have um, a lot of tool life monitoring that's going on um, because it's a lights out system we need every program as a header which tells us how much tool life is remaining so that we can run that job or call in sister tools so we have all these machine strategies so you can monitor where in the life of that tool the cycle is for example if it really is getting to the end of its life it's time to change to a sister tool in yeah, order to at maintain any, at, at any point we're monitoring that so that if, uh, if a tool for example would would expire in two minutes and we need that tool for three minutes we know that up front and then the, the machine is able to use a, du uh, a duplo tool or a sister tool i think what's interesting in this story is the fact that a lot of machines could make this part whether they could make it as quickly as as, as a heller is obviously up for question and debate um, but the second thing here is is the fact that this is all about unmanned running isn't it this is about yeah. the reliability of the process for 24 7 machining of these parts over the contract period Correct. and that's not something that everyone can deliver or achieve is it i think that's the strength of a heller machine you know we we come from a background where we have machines employed in production environments running three shifts 
seven days a week, year on year on year. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's where Heller is a premium product. Mm. Uh, and I think it shines through in projects like this. Um, a couple of final points on the, on the accuracy and the tolerances that you need to achieve. There is a, there is a bore uh, on here that is um, machined, isn't there? And that has to be within, well, you tell me, and how, how do you achieve it? So there is a bore that goes through all of the components as a stack and that's a tolerance of around about 25 microns. So we're talking levels that you would see in automotive parts, um, even finer in some instances. Uh, we achieve that with a line boring fixture and that's a, a bespoke process that we um, put together. It involves uh, putting bushes on a fixture so that the fixture is controlling the accuracy of, of, the, um, of the part. It isolates the machine from that process. So any, any influences in uh, temperature that the machine may be going under uh, is taken out completely. And these are one of the final operations, aren't they? So if you, you've done everything else and something exactly, went wrong yeah. there... There's a know, lot of money on that table the, the at that time. The nerves get worse as, as you go yeah. down the process. So this is it's, it's critical area. And is it the same, what we're talking here as well, Steve, in, in this particular area? Yes, it's exactly yeah. the same there. So we have finishing processes. And all these processes have been designed to reduce the amount of input required by the operator. You know, conventionally these, these processes would have been done on you know, manual machines even, mm. and you've got an awful lot at stake at that point because of the value of the part. Yeah. Um, so we've tried to take away the onus on the operator and automate that as much as possible to give the, the customer the maximum process security when he needs it most, which is when these components are a very high value at the end of the manufacturing chain. Um, these, um, I'm going to ask you the, the, the finishing time on this in a minute, but these are all HSK100 machines, aren't they, that you, that you offer yeah, here, yeah. or that are doing this particular job, capable of obviously that unmanned running. Um, two ops again on, on this, on the finishing. Um, how long, Steve, for the finishing process? This particular sort of smaller part would be around about around about the four and a half hours finishing. Okay, so when you go to your customer, you're able then really to provide him yeah. with a, a solution that, let's say for this example, is around about 10 hours machining, which allows him to then go on and price it accordingly to win the business. But of course, yeah. after all that, when you get the order, you've got to make sure it happens. Exactly, yeah. And that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. It's been absolutely fascinating. No, thank um, you, Paul. Steve, thank you very much. I look forward to covering more uh, parts with you. There you have it. What a fantastic turnkey application there. Um, Steve's just demonstrated why Heller are so prolific in the supply of quality machine tools for unmanned running in various industries. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.